Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. Uh, the series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity, Productivity Project, which is funded by the XA Scale Computing Project of the US Department of, Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration that involves the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley. Ashley from Oak Ridge and I will be the hosts for today's webinar. Uh, workflow for increasing the quality of scientific software. And the webinar will be presented by Tomislav Marik from the uh, Technical University of Darmstadt. Uh, 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 Tomislav is joining us from Germany today. So uh, Tomislav studied mechanical engineering at the University of Zagreb in Croatia and has obtained his PhD at the Institute for Mathematical Modeling and Analysis at TU Darmstadt. And he's currently working at TU Dermstad as an Athen Young investigator. He has been developing structured Lagrangian or Lorian interface approximation methods for simulating two phase flows in the open foam open source software since 2008. He's a member of the Collaborative Research Center at the TU Dermstad, where uh, he supports researchers in developing research software and data. We have issued uh, more than 170 tickets for this webinar. Uh, let's see how many people will be joining us. All attendees have been muted uh, upon entry. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google, the Google Doc. We have pasted this address, uh, the address of the Google Doc in the chat. And the, the webinar will have breaks so uh, Tomislav can respond to the questions that come in. With that, Tomislav, uh, you can take this stand here. <laughs> well, thank you, Osni, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, basically, uh, I'm going to present uh, uh, this workflow that we developed within the Collaborative Research Center, 1194, uh, for increasing the quality of scientific software. And our focus is on computational science and engineering, because basically, this is kind of the, the focus of, of our research here in Darmstadt. Um, and before we get to this schematic image, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the motivation uh, behind this workflow. So um, my personal focus uh, in research is on, on multi-phase flow simulation software. And uh, as you see, uh, basically the goal of the software is to, um, let's say, numerically represent fluids that do not mix with each other and that are separated by this interface, sigma of t. Um, uh, and this interface is now here schematically shown in 2D as a, let's say a set of line segments, but uh, in 3D is going to be a surface. And uh, the goal of these numerical methods is to somehow track uh, sigma as it moves in time and changes its topology. So if you think about, um, I don't know, like uh, a droplet of water uh, impacting uh, a liquid film, uh, it's going to strongly deform, uh, it's going to separate into new droplets that are going to maybe merge together again, and so on and so on. So tracking of these interfaces is, uh, is the numerical goal. And um, well, developing these kinds of methods um, requires very, very thorough testing. So that was kind of the, the motivation for this uh, workflow. Um, the, basically, the idea is to kind of improve what we can simulate uh, by adding geometrical approximation. Uh, to this uh, interface, to the fluid interface. Uh, and for this to really be properly tested, we require uh, verification cases. Uh, these are the cases where we actually have exact solutions, either for the evolution of the fluid interface uh, or some simple two-phase flows uh, where you actually have some exact solutions. Uh, so once this is running, when th once these test cases are running, um, we need to validate with respect to experiments to make sure that uh, we are actually solving physics appropriately, so or mimicking the real world appropriately, and of course, investigate serial and parallel computational efficiency. And um, these methods are not um, uh, proof-based, so it's very difficult to do rigorous mathematical analysis on these, on these methods. Um, uh, so we really need to test a lot. So that's, that's the basic motivation for, the, for this whole workflow that I'm going to present. Um, the, however, there are some uh, boundary and initial conditions. Uh, in this situation, uh, because uh, at universities, uh, we have this um, fortunate publisher perish uh, culture that prioritizes publications over scientific software. Um, and you see this uh, hat, like the academic hat here. 
And I've placed this uh, throughout the talk uh, to, to basically emphasize uh, the points uh, in the workflow where simplification has been done. Um, so um, in order to, so to say, publish instead of perish, right? So um, uh, the, the problem is that uh, dedicated resources for increasing software quality uh, for research software at, at universities are usually not available. So we don't have personnel that can take care of, of testing for us or make sure that the quality is improved. Um, and we also have rotation of, of um, employees. Uh, so from PhD students every four to five years, postdocs every one to two years. And there's often very little uh, or basically no overlap between successors and predecessors. And uh, this complicates uh, the software quality or software development a lot. Uh, furthermore, unfortunately, large scale software design is not a necessary part of the curriculum, um, at least for computational science and engineering. So you can choose it as a course, but it's, it's, not, it's not required. And I, I believe it should be required. Um, so uh, people come in uh, with different backgrounds uh, from applied or pure math, mechanical engineering, physics or informatics. And they are sometimes faced with uh, in-house codes or open source codes that have grown very large in time. And uh, as a real world example, uh, I can, well, let's say, mention onboarding people into OpenFOAM module development. So OpenFOAM is a open source C++ code for, for computational fluid dynamics, and it's quite large. Um, it has its own design patterns and, and uh, it's quite difficult to, to um, program this further uh, for, for people that are just starting. Um, and based on this boundary initial conditions, unfortunately, uh, the situation diverges often at universities. So I've seen a lot of situations where um, people are not being able to continue development from an earlier state, um, simply because, I mean, you, you cannot reproduce, reproduce results from a publication um, because um, there aren't any uh, data, um, uh, source code and publication links uh, so there's, it's very difficult. So once, once uh, one finds a publication to recover the source code and the specific version uh, with its uh, com computing environment uh, that was used to produce the data in the publication, it's extremely difficult. Um, and also, even if, if this is possible, so even in some cases when this was possible, sometimes the numerical uh, methods and models cannot be reused and developed further. And this is, happens because basically uh, the, the software was not implemented in a modular way. Uh, the versions are not integrated or integ integrated completely and huge commits are used or non-granular commits are used in version control. And um, without really, really thorough testing, so where you basically base your testing on, on a researcher executing the tests on the cluster in person, there's no overview of the, of the impact of a change on the rest of the of the module or the rest of your uh, scientific software. So um, what we basically worked on is to figure out a way how we can um, uh, create a workflow that increases the quality of scientific software in this environment. So, um, and we came up with some five, let's say six with a bonus step uh, steps that one can do um, that really uh, improves uh, in our from our perspective, at least, the quality of scientific software um, without causing uh, huge overheads in time or on resources. So, of course, uh, we, we track uh, our issues. So we track our projects using Kanban boards. And recently, um, uh, we adopted uh, progress tracking cards uh, developed by scientific, Better Scientific Software, which is really great. Um, and we use a very simple version control branching model um, and apply test-driven development for uh, computational science and engineering software. Uh, and then uh, enable, once the local tests are running, so to say, we enable continuous integration, but with an emphasis uh, on results, on visualizing results, right? Um, and periodically, uh, when we are happy with what we have, or if something went really wrong, uh, we archive everything and cross-link everything. So we, we cross-link software uh, results, data, uh, and report or article whenever we reach our milestone. And as I said, we can this can be a happy milestone where something uh, was submitted to peer review and a publication has been accepted or, or if we unfortunately get, have to give up on an idea, which also happens. We do this uh, when we also give up on something because uh, sometimes uh, time passes and someone else uh, has some other idea and we want to be able to start um, or, or restart it, so to say. Um, and as a bonus step, uh, we also publish singularity images that contain uh, the code and uh, the data and the computing environment um, necessary to re reproduce everything. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, the workflow is, uh, was developed uh, using OpenFOAM or OpenFOAM projects and modules, but it's tested with, with other software um, here in Darmstadt, also in-house software. And this is a necessary disclaimer because um, the OpenFOAM trademark um, is owned by OpenCFD. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about this uh, simple version control branching model first. So um, we have small teams, uh, two to five people uh, that are usually working on the same project. Uh, in, in, in our teams. And what we figured is that uh, if we apply um, two um, things, a separation of, of concerns and single responsibility principles, this uh, sig uh, significantly simplifies the, the branching model. So separation of concerns is basically uh, telling us to organize our source code in different layers and sections that are like minimally overlapping or non -overla not overlapping at all. Um, and with single responsibility, we write functions or classes um, that uh, perform single or uh, at least clear tasks. And these two principles can be applied on uh, every software, uh, however, not dogmatically. So the, the point is not to really write tiny classes with, uh, I don't know, three, three lines of code per member function or something like that. It's to think about um, reducing the number of responsibilities and not write all powerful classes and functions. And uh, when we are talking about open foam, uh, we already have some object oriented and generic uh, software design patterns that are used there. And uh, we basically apply those um, to further extend uh, the, the, the source code. The, the problem is, however, so even if this is done and, and we reduce the, the branching um, or merge uh, conflict, so to say, um, uh, with single responsibility and separation of concerns, so we have different people working on different things. Um, and, and joining this together. The question is who is going to take care of the change integration? I think this is the crucial question at universities. And um, from our experience, uh, this can usually be only done by maintainers that are experienced. So either postdocs uh, or PhD students that are here for a longer time, uh, they manage the integration. Um, and uh, what we uh, basically do, we protect main and development branches and they are directly managed by maintainers uh, and they are responsible for uh, Git tags um, that we use to snapshots, of course, uh, specific um, versions at milestones and also clean up. So um, on the main branch, uh, we basically, the maintainers integrate uh, stuff from accepted publications in the development branch. On the development, we um, uh, integrate uh, uh, changes that were done on feature branches that are CI tested. And on feature branches is basically chaos, so to say. <laughs> So we, we uh, aim to do um, a single responsibility principle or apply it as much as we can um, uh, to um, allow researchers to work on different files. Um, and uh, this uh, minimizes uh, Git conflicts as much as, as much as possible. If it happens, then the team that's working on the same class or the same algorithm, same member function, they, they resolve it. And then they, they submit uh, a merge request that goes through CI uh, continuous integration uh, loops. Um, and what we found is uh, any kind of like, there are many different really nice branching workflows, but um, the, the more complex things get, uh, the more difficult they um, uh, be, become to, let's say, be adopted in, in university research teams that are under a lot of pressure to publish. Okay, so um, I don't know if there are any questions about version control or, or this, uh, we can maybe take in some questions. There, there is, hi, uh, there is one question. Yes, there actually there are two, but I think the first one I'm gonna leave it for later. So the question is how much of their time do the members of each team actually devote to code development for the project? How long are periods that things don't move ahead? What other responsibilities uh, does a PhD student usually undertake in your group? Yeah, it's something that's uh, a very, very, that's a great question. I mean, that's uh, all the time. I mean, I would say at least from, from our experience here in, in the CRC, um, even uh, experimental researchers, uh, they spend uh, a majority of their time, so to say, uh, writing scripts for image processing, of course, after the experimental setup has been built, this is a, a huge amount of effort as well. But for simulation scientists or computational science and engineering scientists here, uh, most of the time is um, spent uh, programming. And uh, that's why I find this really problematic um, because it doesn't have, have the, so to say, focus it deserves uh, software engineering. Uh, we are what we do daily, and if, if we program eight hours per day, then we are programmers. So a lot of the time spent on that, yeah. So there is another one here. Going back to the first item on the list, I wonder if you can comment on the Kanban board, your experience yeah. using it. 
getting others to use it to gather around on it on a regular basis? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, we tried uh, using uh, Agile and, and Jira actually also um, and apply this to, to uh, inside the Collaborative Research Center. The problem was basically that it's, it was a huge overkill as, because again, coming back to the pressure uh, or the scientific pressure to publish that I'm feeling also daily, <laughs> um, uh, getting people to adopt uh, separating uh, things into epics, uh, uh, stories, tasks and subtasks and maintaining these boards was a huge difficulty. And uh, with Kanban boards, uh, at least what we basically can uh, see is that um, uh, this keeps things uh, very loose. So there's not such a strict prescribed st structure and uh, people see the benefits in at least um, having an overview of all the problems and all the tasks at hand that have to be done. Uh, so this is something that's at least directly beneficial. And how to get them to use that? That's that's what I mentioned uh, about the the progress tracking cards. Well, what we what we managed to uh, what we what we noticed is that if we use program tracking uh, progress tracking cards, um, then uh, people that work together uh, work together on the same list of subtasks. And when you put the people together, then um, the output is much much greater. If if you know if you this structure the project in terms of um, epic stories and then leave each and every person to their own subtasks, uh, then things don't get maintained. But this way, working in pairs or working like three to, to, to five people on these progress tracking, tracking cards, this makes a huge difference, at least from our perspective. So which system do you use for Kanban boards? Trello or simple post-it notes? <laughs> uh, yeah, we just we are just on GitLab. We're just yeah, using GitLab boards. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another one here before we continue, how do you get around the problem where one student, oops, let's see here, where one student or postdoc ends up doing everything, but ends up destroying their chance for career advancement in academia? Okay, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a question that I sometimes, I mean, that worries me because, um, I mean, I'm a postdoc that's trying to survive in academia. And I'm working on on uh, I'm trying to apply this uh, all these all these things because um, kind of like the methods that I'm working on they they require this. So if if we don't test things, then things explode. It's not like we get one percent uh, uh, worse uh, solution or something or something fails gracefully. So we are dealing with highly stiff and nonlinear problems. And if there's a smallest error, everything then <laughs> everything will be bad. So I was kind of forced into this. Um, but um, to do like proper research, but uh, yeah, I mean it's a, it's a complicated question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know honestly. No, I mean on one hand side, uh, scientific output supposedly is going to also be measured by um, other things, not just uh, peer-reviewed publications. And um, recently, uh, more and more journals are opening up to to also code contributions and data. So um, I guess this one way would be to, uh, let's say, publish um, your research uh, in your field uh, in methods papers uh, where you just talk about uh, your scientific results uh, and then uh, clean up the code. And as soon as the code is cleaned up, uh, you can also publish your papers in journals that are specific uh, for source code, like software, software X or computer physics communications um, uh, or similar uh, journals. So this could increase the, the impact of, of the work. I mean, at least that's what I hope for myself as well. I hope this answers partially. Okay, so I'm kept, keeping a, a track here of the questions that are coming through the, the chat and I'm pasting them into the Google Doc. Uh, we'll go back, get back to them later. Please, for the sake of time, continue. To, to okay, okay, thank you. So um, yeah, so let's move to uh, test-driven uh, development. Uh, so um, test-driven development is usually something that um, yeah, people think about uh, when they're writing software somewhere in industry, but it turns out uh, it can be at least like roughly applied also on scientific software uh, with a huge uh, amount of benefit. Uh, so um, test-driven development means um, defining your tests at the start. So not starting to program your scientific libraries that do some algorithms, uh, but uh, instead uh, we define verification and validation test cases uh, uh, at the beginning. Um, and this places the focus on the final result. So you want to get uh, interpolation schemes, integration schemes, some discretization methods, PDE solutions, or even physics uh, improved. 
And uh, if somebody, if, if we start writing tests for these things immediately, uh, then we stay focused on what we want to actually reach uh, uh, with the research. Um, and this is kind of uh, a top-down instead of bottom-up uh, test coverage. Um, and uh, we don't go overboard with unit tests. Um, so uh, we basically write uh, CSE tel tests. We are doing some, some, some kind of like optimistic test-driven development because we are hoping that the CSE tests are going to work. And when they start failing, and they will, uh, we then extend unit tests um, uh, uh, for debugging a failing CSE test. And all, only uh, all from, from this like top-down approach. Um, and this keeps also uh, the test input focused on real world data. Instead of doing some kind of mock-up of, of the input or mock-up of the library or mock-up of anything, uh, we are um, hands-on, um, uh, let's say, developing tests that we are actually then using later on to publish our uh, research. And in this case, it's keeping us focused and I think it's improving quality from the beginning. Um, and the question is also then, um, so what's the improvement of the application programming interface that's usually kind of the outcome of using test-driven development? Well, um, if um, somebody is writing a new code, like completely from scratch, uh, then it's of course easier to program the uh, application programming interface that uh, you wish for if you're its first user. So then the, the freedom is there to, to do things correctly. And uh, in this case, I like this uh, quote from uh, Scott Meyer's um, uh, book. So making the class interfaces easy to use correctly and difficult to use incorrectly. So put on the user hat of your own library and make sure that the library is clean. So reducing number of function arguments, uh, single responsibility, again, clear naming, uh, commutation of arguments and different things can be uh, then used to improve the source code. Um, however, um, if legacy code is used, which is uh, also uh, often the case, uh, the goal is to extend the existing API without um, uh, modification. Extending here means uh, in terms of functionality, right? So the interface stays um, uh, the same. And with open form, the idea is to understand class hierarchies. And with this sentence, basically it describes how to work with open form, I guess, any object oriented software. So you need to find the base class that allows you to uh, uh, select a model during runtime, which in, in open form is called like runtime type selection uh, pattern. And you find a virtual function um, that you want to overload uh, and overload the virtual function. So if this can be explained to, to uh, PhD students at their beginning, um, this is already uh, a lot. So um, of course, another point is uh, reducing code duplication. And, and our, um, so to say, experience is that basically we don't want to write test applications and then write solver applications. You know, and when I say solver, in our case, it's the uh, solver application solves a system of partial differential equations. So we write the solver application uh, just um, to, uh, to behave as a test application with a different input. Um, uh, and uh, basically what we, what we do, we um, modulate data outputs and additional checks by compile time or runtime options. And this, this kind of makes sure that uh, we don't duplicate code on application level uh, or application layer uh, by two more or less. Okay, um, and this is a part uh, that basically connects to the visualization and let's say the focus on computational science and engineering, we find that we can manipulate tests or let's say interact with tests and document them and process them using Jupyter Notebooks. And um, there have been some other works I will mention later on that uh, wrote their own uh, parsers uh, for, for data and visualization and Jupyter Notebooks are so powerful. I mean, I can, there's, I cannot recommend them enough. So we document everything. We document geometry, initial and boundary conditions, uh, error norm that we're using, comparison data from experiments if we have them. We process uh, the errors um, inside the notebooks um, and we do result analysis in terms of like interactive result analysis, which is really straightforward. We can do it interactively as parameter studies are running or we can do it even remotely uh, if things are running on the cluster. So if the parameter variation is running on the cluster. Um, the, the question that uh, is then, um, uh, that then arises, so how to organize uh, parameter studies is what we are doing. So um, we basically have a, a main Jupyter notebook uh, that contains li links to other notebooks. And um, we have different studies uh, organized into folders. And each of this uh, parameter study uh, basically generates uh, cases uh, where each individual case uh, is associated with a parameter vector and also with a set of secondary data. And this secondary data is basically what you see 
in uh, scientific publications. So when you read a paper, you see a diagram or a table that these are these, uh, these files basically here. Um, and if we start something uh, on, a, on a high performance machine or even on a cluster, we can log in from outside and um, interactively analyze what, what is going wrong as things are running. Right? They're often going wrong, of course. Okay, so um, the problem with parameter tests um, is that um, both primary, so the simulation uh, results, primary data, and secondary data, uh, the data that is uh, behind the diagrams and tables, they need to be organized really properly. Uh, because we are measuring the quality of our software against verification and validation data, yes, okay, this, this is usually coming from other publications or some from exact solutions or experiments, but we also want to have uh, effective comparison with um, previous versions of our own co code. So we need to be we need to know if something was improved with respect to the last version or not and um, with legacy codes and under a lot of pressure uh, we uh, use the existing folder structure and parameterization tools so usually people that developed even in-house codes they have their own way of working with data and we just keep this the only uh, important aspect there is that this mapping between a case and a parameter vector should be stored somehow um, that it can be progr uh, uh, programmatically analyzed. It can, it can be a CSV file, a YAML file, something, whatever, it, as long as it's um, um, uh, easy to, to load and, and uh, investigate uh, quickly. However, if new code is, is programmed, uh, then there are options. So either the simple folder and file structure can be used like, like above, uh, or um, uh, something better can be used that depends on the force resources and pressure. <laughs> So uh, either HDF5 uh, or some other open data format, or we find, uh, found an interesting alternative to HDF5, which is called XDIR, um, uh, which is basically uh, organizing uh, data similar to this, what I mentioned here in this slide, um, by adding some, some uh, information about metadata in each um, subfolder. So, so far for uh, primary data, which is, are actually huge like simulation results, large results, uh, we should now talk about secondary data, so tables and diagrams. And in, in my opinion, um, these are much more important uh, because these are the things that are actually being compared when we are publishing papers. Um, so uh, what we use uh, is really simple comma separated value tables. And we are putting metadata um, uh, as, so to say, uh, columns inside these tables. So what are metadata? So if, um, if you look at the table below, um, uh, you will see that the metadata is repeated. So this um, uh, um, value here, this shear 2D string is um, associating every row of this table to a specific uh, parameter variation, right? So even though we repeat this metadata, that's not an issue uh, because this secondary data is usually tiny compared to the simulation data and the time required to obtain them. So this strongly, strongly simplifies data analysis, right? So, um, uh, and it's a simple format that allows also direct export of tables to LaTeX, and you can use this in publication, of course, without this index with the velocity model index, you can then drop, of course, um, uh, in a publication, but it can be directly used in a publication. It saves a lot of time if you do it like that. Um, we try doing it differently. We tried using also for secondary data, uh, HDF5 and different things, and um, it caused a lot of overhead. And this is quite a simple solution that we are very happy with. Okay, so also before we go to continuous integration, maybe we can take in some questions. Yeah, let me see. There are a bunch of questions here. Let me see which one here, uh, the one. Okay, so this is an interesting one here. So you propose a workflow for improving the quality of CSE software, computational science and engineering software, but do not define what you mean by quality. How does this relate to software quality? I, um, in other words, no functional requirements, but it is broadly understood by the field of software engineering. Um, yeah, so uh, we are looking at software quality, uh, so to say, uh, from different perspectives. So you have first um, the perspective of being able to find and reproduce scientific results. Um, a second uh, is that re these results are so good that the publication is going to be accepted. And third, the ability to have sustainable software. So the ability to be able to develop software further. 
And um, uh, these are maybe not uh, high level or super uh, standards uh, compared to software engineering practices, which are available ever, uh, elsewhere or, or used in, in the software industry, but we are starting from zero. So uh, we are starting from this. Yeah, this is the our start. So, um, and this is a very bad start. So of course, um, ideally, when we are we are we are looking at uh, open foam, as I mentioned. So I'm currently I'm, I'm working with open foam since since 15 years. So I mean, we want uh, our mod models and modules to be implemented using uh, design patterns that are already there in the software. And if you are writing new software, if you are writing new scientific software, we also apply software design patterns. But this is not what is being tested in the in the first row, so to say, right? We are we are. We are testing this. So we are testing the ability to create scientific output quickly, to reproduce data quickly, to find software um, that was used for a publication quickly, and to be able to further develop this software. And if the software cannot be further developed because uh, somebody didn't implement a, a model in a modular way, uh, if you remember from the start, I mentioned it's like we have two to five people working on, on this. So we will find this out soon. If somebody hacked something and, and it's bad. So, yeah, I hope this answers the question. Yeah, I see a number of interesting questions here, but uh, uh, again, so for the sake of time, so we are, uh, uh, so Tommy's live is going to go through all these questions and it will be sent in the, the final QA to all participants um, um, as soon as the QA is, is ready. Uh, but so please continue, then we'll come back to the questions later. Um, yeah, so um, once all of the stuff that I just described is working, um, uh, it's working locally, uh, locally meaning, I mean, on a cluster, on a high performance computing machine workstation. Um, uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to ensure uh, that um, uh, the automatic testing is, is enabled. Uh, so uh, that it becomes easier to, to uh, ensure that the tests are working properly, even when modifications are done by some PhD student that just started yesterday. And this is nothing special. So we're just we're using standard practices um, and we added a couple of steps in between uh, for uh, processing and visualizing results that I just mentioned with these uh, notebooks and publishing those results, results in a GitLab pages repository or viewing those uh, results um, as GitLab artifacts. So this is a standard situation where you have a user pushing some changes to um, uh, her or his um, uh, repository, uh, executing a merge request that triggers the CI pipeline. We, uh, software is built uh, on a GitLab runner, uh, the tests are run, then we process and visualize, publish results, either as artifacts or as blog posts, and then we check if the tests are pa have passed or not. So um, in order to do that, we need to figure out um, uh, which testing machines we have available and how to categorize our tests. So um, if we have like scientific software where we have two seconds, uh, where the CI takes literally two seconds on a single core, um, uh, then we use really short uh, few CPU core tests um, um, and we use the work PC for that. If we have short many core tests, when I say short in this case, it can be 24 hours or something. Um, then we use um, a workstation with a 64 core CPU that we, that we got within the collaborative research center. The question is then um, what to do with HPC tests because they are necessary and relevant for production and for performance measurements. Um, um, and this workflow that I'm talking about uses cores or let's say smoke tests. So we make sure that the unit tests, convergence and validation and verification is running for tests one and two and that the code is efficient and parallel for one and two. So for the short few core or short many core tests. And this is like an open challenge that we currently have. Uh, is it possible? Of course, it's possible to combine these two tests or so short few CPU cores, short many core tests with an HPC machine. Uh, it's natural, yes. The question is, if this is this possible in our environment with our boundary conditions? So with, with the pressure that we have. So can we figure out a simple workflow that will allow us to do this uh, very, very easily? So uh, what we uh, use, we use uh, GitLab uh, for continuous integration and we set up a GitLab runner with a Docker executor uh, and we use a local uh, Docker image. 
And um, uh, what we do, um, of course, one can pull uh, the, the, so to say, Docker image uh, from the Docker Hub, but for groups that uh, are, let's say, um, I don't want to use public images. It's also a possibility to, to use it locally, of course, with specific pool policy. I just wanted to add this as a detail here. Um, uh, however, um, when building software, uh, files that are created within a job are gone when this job ends. Um, GitLab uses something called job artifacts uh, to pass on data from one job to the next. And these job artifacts only work with files that are stored in project subfolders. So um, we have to make sure that the libraries and applications or solvers that we have compiled um, are passed to other jobs as artifacts. And those artifacts can be downloaded uh, from GitLab. So when the CI pipeline is running, as soon as um, um, uh, running jobs are finished, uh, we can examine our um, results. So um, with OpenFOAM, this becomes a bit uh, problematic because it has out of sources installation. Um, so binaries are only available outside of the repository. And we have to use environmental variables uh, to basically um, install everything uh, using OpenFOAM environmental variables outside of the repository. And then um, uh, within the build job, uh, we create artifact folders inside the repository and then copy all these uh, library and application binaries to artifact folders and export them. And then when we have to run something, uh, we can uh, copy um, everything from the artifact folders to the environmental variables and just run the tests. Right, because um, uh, I don't know how, how other in-house codes do, uh, do this uh, or other open source uh, software does this, but with OpenFOAM, uh, there's this out of source um, installation that complicates uh, the CI a bit. And um, now we are basically here. So we, we built everything, we um, uh, have executed the, the test there, they are running, and now we want to process and visualize um, results. And uh, how to do that? So um, these Jupyter notebooks that I mentioned on the previous slide are there in our repository. We can find them all and um, run them. And as we run them in batch mode, um, we convert them to different formats. And uh, these notebooks, they agglomerate secondary data, so the diagrams and tables uh, into these pandas multi-index CSV files, and they are exported as artifacts um, and can be then viewed uh, and downloaded and examined. Um, and the test evaluation is then really straightforward because um, the notebooks did all the work and they stored all the, all the tables that, that, that we want to have. And then we can easily test if some convergence of some error norm is greater than two or something, or is, is do we have the difference between the simulation and an experiment that's less than 4% or something like that. So um, yeah, um, I can just hopefully show this. So this is a test case that basically that failed this is a tiny example. I linked it. Uh, it's on GitLab. It's open source and it's publicly accessible if you if you want to use it. So you see that in the testing phase, the test has failed. So um, if we click here, we can see basically that some kind of uh, um, order of convergence for an error in the infinity norm um, is uh, not larger than 1.7. Um, and then if we um, examine the visualization, we can download an artifact. And of course, this is like very, very simple now because it's a kind of a minimal working example. And you have this notebook that basically shows you the diagram and it shows you the case where it, where it crashed, so to say, where, it, where the divergence happened. Now, since we are exporting the data, we can open this notebook here and we can interactively um, work with the data and see why the things have failed. Okay, so yeah, before we go on to cross-linking, maybe should we address something re regarding continuous integration, if there are some questions on that. Um, I think it's better if you continue to go back to the, get back to the questions later. Okay, okay. So yeah, then, and this addresses the kind of software quality from the scientific perspective. So what do we want to have in the end? So if a researcher does a literature survey, we want to be able to, uh, from a uh, scientific publication on an article, to quickly find the data sets, um, the uh, image uh, of the software with, with its environment and the repository snap snapshot, as well as the actively maintained Git repository um, uh, with the respective Git tag um, that makes sure that we can access the actual source code. Um, it's kind of live on the repository that was used to generate data in the article. And um, if you're using, um, 
but if you are adding this information inside the article in, in references that we basically cite. And then if we use the metadata on a data repository, like, I don't know, Zenodo or something, click share, we are using TU data lib, but there's a uh, TU downshot data repository that we're using for that. Um, and if you're using uh, tag, get tag descriptions uh, to add the same metadata here, uh, then we can cross link everything. So um, whatever is basically found, be it a data set or a git tag, we can immediately, immediately find an article that's connected to this git tag or a data set that's connected to it and so on. So the question is like, where did, does the singularity image now come from? Well, um, it is singularity is more intuitive than Docker in our, our experience at least. It natively handles images as files, and as an engineer, I mean, I'm used to at least working with files and not with containers. Um, uh, mechanical engineer, to be precise. Um, so, uh, and it's built for, for HPC from the start, um, um, and it doesn't require root rights, maps, um, uh, basically the user space into the container, so we have the result data that remains in the host. And um, the question is then, why don't we replace Docker with singularity, uh, with singularity within the GitLab CI? And we, this is what we are learning how to do. And even if this works, again, uh, when we suggest this workflow, I mean, I'm doing it for my projects, but if I suggest it to some other researcher and then tell him, oh yeah, you have to write GitLab custom executor for your software, the question is, does this uh, still survive publish or perish test? Because if this is an overhead for some postdoc with two, three or people working on a small software, it's not going to be adopted. Um, and uh, we are adding source code snapshots on top of the image in the repository because uh, active repositories can get migrated or deleted. And uh, this uh, provides quick and direct access to the source code from the publication. Okay, and this is how it looks like for like a live, um, live review. Uh, so to say, we have a singularity image that's uh, part of a publication that is currently um, under review. Um, and you can uh, clone, the code, clone the code repository, build the software under tests, and open these Jupyter notebooks that I'm mentioning from within the image um, with a few commands, which is really great. At least for, for article reviewers, they can do this without installing dependencies on, on their machine. Of course, there are many, many other workflows and back practices. I'm, I'm combing the literature myself now and finding similar things published elsewhere as well. Um, uh, this list may not be complete, uh, probably is not, most likely it's not. And I found this publication here um, that's most similar to what we are doing with the difference um, of um, using uh, some JSON formats and, and web tools uh, for data visualization, which we basically replaced by this uh, Jupyter Notebooks. I, I wasn't even aware of that publication up to, up to recently, but it's really, really nice. So other people are catching on, to, on, on this uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, as for lessons were, uh, learned, um, again, to emphasize, I mean, keeping the workflow as simple as possible is crucial for acceptance because um, if the workflow takes a lot of time uh, and overhead, uh, this is not going to be accepted. Um, it's not at, at, uh, from our experience at universities. And uh, focusing on secondary data simplifies this workflow a lot. Uh, because uh, for simulations that are short, that run under 24 hours, uh, primary data can be recomputed quickly um, if the software is um, sustainably programmed um, and works, uh, which puts a proper pressure also on the software to be able to do that for primary data, which is not, not bad. Um, uh, also, this periodical cross-linking of research data, um, uh, this is done very quickly. It's very beneficial, so we, we reach milestones every couple of months and we, it takes us a couple of hours to do this periodical cross-linking. And it's quite beneficial for scientific publication uh, publications, and I think it should be adopted more often in computational science and engineering. The question, of course, of personal responsibility uh, is very important at, at university research groups. So who are the maintainers? I mean, I listed the idea of a maintainer, but the question is also what are the incentive for maintainers? And this was the question raised for the postdoc, how to survive with, with something like this. Well, maybe, yeah co-authorship on a paper or something like that. I don't know. Um, and what we found is like fixing the parallel input output of, of legacy codes requires a huge amount of effort and should be done by experts and outside of research uh, projects, definitely. Okay, so um, as for the outlook, uh, right now we have these performance jobs running on, on 60 core work, four core workstations and we're moving on to the cluster. Uh, the question is if this singularity GitLab executor is going to work or is it simple to set up or not? Um, we are considering to use uh, Jupyter Hub immediately uh, to be able to interactively uh, together analyze the notebooks. 
and um, uh, uh, automatic publishing and cross-linking of, of these artifacts is possible. But as I mentioned, um, we do this every couple of months, so um, it's not uh, probably it's going to probably more comp complicate the workflow without the substantial benefit. And yeah, I'm very thankful to the German Research Foundation that that uh, funded uh, fund this research. Um, and the Collaborative Research Center 1194 interaction between transport and vetting processes here in the Darknet. So if there are some any more questions, I would be happy to discuss them. Very nice, Tomislav. Yeah, there are questions here. So let's see if I can uh, put them in, a, in order here. So, um, for example, uh, this one here. What code-related skills would you, you would you wish that masters um, or CSE students acquire? You cannot answer version controller testing. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, I mean, I'm working with C++. Um, so I would say, so object-oriented programming, uh, dynamic polymorphism, encapsulation, um, uh, and uh, object-oriented design patterns. Uh, so um, yeah, subject observer pattern, build patterns, uh, all those patterns that are crucial, decorator pattern, basically a couple of patterns or at least the knowledge that there are such things as design patterns and basic mechanisms of the dynamic polymorphism if they're working with C++ codes. I think this should be definitely definitely learned. And if, if not, then at least uh, design patterns, yeah, because they are uh, in every programming language there. So even in Python code, you'll have some kind of uh, design patterns. Um, so so this, is, this is something what I mentioned before, the large scale software design. This should be taught. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going backwards here in the question. So let's see this one here. For my personal experiences, usually most users tend to use the development branch and then the main branch becomes little, not very interesting. Do you have any comments or suggestions? Um, yeah, I mean, when we periodically, when a paper gets accepted or we have some kind of improvement where we are 100% sure that it's uh, improving everything, uh, then we merge uh, from development to master. So every time that we have an accepted paper, we, we merge to, 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 to main branch. Yeah. Um, now, um, on slide eight, you mentioned the principle of a single responsibility. Is there a reason that you have not incorporated the other four principles from uh, solid, right? Uh, I. Uh, in other words, open closed principle, this cough substitution principle, interface aggregation principle, and the dependency inversion principle. Yeah, I mean, uh, this list of substitution and all this stuff. Um, I mean, we are, as I mentioned, we are using open foam. So, of course, there's like operator overloading, there's abstract interfaces inside, and all of that stuff. But um, uh, here I'm talking about um, uh, version control branching model so uh, I'm, I'm kind of talking about things that make it possible for uh, so to say two people to work together um, without um, modifying the same files a lot so to separate things so we separate software into layers and we are separating so to say um, um, functionality into different classes and yes of course i mean abstract classes should also be used and abstract interfaces there's a bunch of stuff that uh, should also be there yeah I don't have anything against them or anything. It's just these are the two that, that um, from my experience, um, were kind of more important than, than the others. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe there's much more that I can learn. I would be happy to learn, of course. So, OK, there are more questions. But what I suggest, so basically, I'm going to open the floor for questions. So participants can unmute themselves. For example, William, uh, would you like to ask your question directly to uh, Tomislav? You just wrote in the chat. Yeah. Can you hear please. me? Yes, please. Yeah. So you just basically listed a large group of things that pretty much assumes the person has a master's or close to it in software engineering. So how do you actually keep them in science when the when the fangs of the world are going to pay them three times what we can and give them more soft uh, give them more career stability? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's a question. I mean, also for me, I guess as well. I mean, I I, I don't know myself. Uh, I'm going to survive in academia with this, but um, I think I mean, what's great about science is um, the freedom to research and uh, this this creativity that that one has in in uh, in the job. And I think this is something that's really really great. 
I mean, you can start your day and just think of ideas and implement them, hopefully properly with something similar to what I've just talked about. So what keeps me personally, I can talk about myself. I mean, what keeps me personally is this kind of creativity and, and scientific discussion and research. And, and this is something that's, that's great. I, I love that. So I don't know. I mean, for others, I cannot speak for others, but I guess um, um, I, this could be a good, actually, if you turn it around, it could be a good motivation for people because at least uh, uh, here in, uh, in the Collaborative Research Center, we have a lot of um, mechanical engineers um, uh, that, that, are, that are in the center. And uh, most of those, they end up in Germany in industry. And knowing all these things is hugely beneficial for them. So I, I think it's a win-win, I guess. I mean, people that then decide to stay in academia have these cool tools that they can use to like make good software or better software, hopefully. And those that don't, they uh, have better CVs for the industry. So the, the only loss is like, if you want to stay in academia and you put in a lot of effort into this and some papers are missing, then you hear this from reviewers. I, I've heard this personally recently. So yeah. I hope this answers it a bit. Yeah, that, that's a good discussion. Uh, more questions from the from the audience, please. Uh, participants, feel free to unmute and uh, ask directly. Tomislav, I see still the questions here coming into the, the Google Doc. Uh, Tomislav will go through those questions and answer them, and we'll be sending the Q&A to all folks uh, next, sometime next week. Um, let's see, while... So again, feel free to unmute. I see a longer question. Yeah, what, one, yeah go ahead, please. one more question here. Uh, so you commented on how to migrate, say, legacy code to this workflow, but can you can you comment like uh, more on that? Like, what would you prioritize in this process of taking a pre-existing project and wanting to implement these ideas? Yeah, I would, I would start basically with, um, uh, with version control and with this cross-linking um, idea. So this is something that you don't need continuous integration to do uh, the cross-linking uh, of uh, all the research data. So things like this. So or, or organizing um, the tests, writing tests first, uh, applying version control on the project, and then making sure that when you reach a milestone, your paper looks like this. Um, yeah. And, and your data looks like this. So, I mean, this is already, I mean, from the, from the point of, let's say, research data management, uh, a lot. Um, and then um, uh, you can basically see if, if you have more time, um, if you want to invest in automatizing all of that. And CI is, it's like nothing, it's just, the script. so you think of this as a script. It basically is a script. It's a file where you write some commands that you usually do manually yourself. So it's like, in effect, um, what I notice is like that this is actually some saving some time. Um, uh, once this, uh, uh, let's say, structure of the of the YAML file is understood for for this uh, continuous integration, it's just like writing a shell script that uh, performs all your tests for you on your local PC. So without going to a cluster or something and keeping things simple, using the work PC at the institute. Uh, you can enable this and make sure that all the like conversions tests and everything else is running. So I would say version control, um, then organizing the data into um, organizing your data, right? Using Jupyter notebooks, cross-linking, and then at the end, if you have time and resources, uh, this thing. So continuous integration. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Tomislav, let me get this, pass this one here to you. So you propose a workflow for improving the quality of CSE software, but did not define what you mean by quality. How does this relate to software quality? I know functional requirements that it is broadly understood by the field of software engineering. I don't think we've addressed that one. Um. Yeah, so um, it, what what's, uh, I was saying before, so of course, um, this is some kind of hidden here in this line. So of course, um, uh, there is a need for, 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 for this uh, large scale software design and there is a need for design patterns and, uh, uh, you know, focusing on abstract inter interfaces, ensuring that, you know, you're, you're I don't know, Functions that take two arguments um, uh, uh, can be uh, like the arguments can be commuted and things like this. Um, uh, but 
I am not sure. I mean, with, with the stuff that I just shown, um, I am with my one leg out of the academia because of the effort it takes. Okay. So, uh, of course, there's much, much more to be done. Um, but I personally, for myself, don't know uh, how, how uh, to apply this uh, within a workflow. So, how to test software quality. I mean, um, yeah. I can I can understand open form. I understand these design patterns, and I teach them to my students, right? But um, I wouldn't go as far as to meet a new group of people, right, in in the university, to like two to five persons that are that are writing their own software and say, yeah, now you have to learn software design patterns and you have to lint your code and do code quality checks automatically and all this stuff. I I, I don't know. I honestly. I don't know that this this if this is possible to apply uh, at least in in uh, this publish or perish environment. If I would, I would be really happy to learn. I mean, if there's some suggestions on how to do this easily and quickly, um, I would be really happy to learn about that. Hey James, would you like to ask your question about this? Sure, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I I might say actually most academics get very upset when reviewers limp their code and then reject their paper, but they have to do that. Um, my question is, is about, uh, I mean, you've described this workflow, which basically relies on tests and research questions as tests expressed as Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks. Um, but there's often an exploratory process in developing methodology. And that sounds to be the chaos that you kind of alluded to in the feature branches. Um, so have, how, in your experience, has the exploratory phase of research manifested itself in this workflow? And does it fit with it? Or have you had to train people how to do this? Um, well, um, basically, um, with what I'm working on with these methods here, um, yeah, uh, let's say, luckily, um, we have a set of canonical verification and validation cases already out there. So for two-phase flows, you know what you need to do uh, in order to have um, a better numerical software. So, um, you know, you need to be able to, your method needs to be volume conservative. Uh, it needs to be numerically bounded. It needs to be some meaning stable. This means it will probably converge. So you need to check for convergence. Then um, there's some physics involved in fluid dynamics. Surface tension forces need to be modeled properly. Proper, appropriately. They need to be balanced on the interface. So we know all that. And there's a bunch of questions that are still open for these methods since they were developed originally in Los Alamos in, in, in the 40s. So for us, the research question is not uh, what's the question is like how to get there. Um, so I personally didn't have this uh, kind of um, the chaos that we have is basically that we have different ideas of how to reach to this, how to reach this point. And then we have to adapt. We have to change these notebooks. We have to adapt the workflow and all this other stuff. So I'm, I don't, maybe I didn't understand the question, but um, with, us, with us, we we see the goal. We know the goal. So um, oh, that's yeah, that's that's yeah. exactly it. So if you have a you have well posed questions which can be implemented as as tests, it's it's kind of like the the contract can be defined, but the yeah. solution is unknown, and that is the thing that is the research question. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions from the? Uh, from the audience, from the participants. I'd actually, I'd like to thank all the participants for the great questions there. It's something that we look for in the webinar, this webinar series, it's really great. So I don't think we'll have time to cover all the questions here, uh, all the, the, uh, but Tom is live, um, we'll interact and uh, he'll go through the Q&A. And uh, as I said before, we'll send the Q&A to you folks um, uh, early next week. Um, with that, I'll, uh, you know, for the sake of time here, everybody's time. So I'm going to take the, 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 I'd like to share my final screen here, my final slide rather. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so again, please give us feedback. You know, there is this survey that we created. These slides are already available uh, online. So the recording will be available perhaps later today. Uh, and I'd like to announce the next webinar in the series. That's going to be in a little more than a month. And that's, I think, is an interesting topic. 
automated Fortran C++ bindings for large scale scientific applications. We already opened the Zoom for, you know, for people to register. Uh, the, the, this webinar is going to be presented by Seth Johnson from Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, with that, thank you very much, everybody. So thank you, Tomislav. Uh, if people are willing to stay uh, a little longer here and ask questions to um, to Tomislav, Tomislav is willing to stay a little longer. That's fine with me too. Uh, what do you think, Tomislav? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, if you can just continue discussing if there's some more questions. Yes, if people are interested, yeah, sure. It's uh, up to you folks, participants. Thank you very much again. This was a very, yeah, so I, yeah, very good food for thought there in the, the Q&A. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, I have a bit of a long question in the document. I don't know if you can start trying to address some of it uh, regarding specifics of CFD. Would you like to ask um, it? I, I saw the, yeah, it's, yes, I saw the longer question here. So, but if you'd like to go, to, uh, would like me to read or, or would you, you could ask directly if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, there, there's, I, I ended up breaking it up in, in two. I mean, in my experience with CFD software, essentially, this top down approach is what we used to do. Um, was uh, essentially tested against concocted exact solutions of the Euler or Navier-Stokes equations. So obviously because in most cases, unless it's some laminar flow, you don't have an exact solution or at least an exact solution that's interesting enough to really trigger bugs in the software. Um, you end up creating a more complicated solution by putting some sort of unphysical forcing function on the right-hand side. So is this the type of top-up top-down testing that you're talking about or something different. Um, and, and at least if that's what it is, it was my experience at the time that despite trying to cook up interesting cases, um, and this was the 90s uh, back then, so like most of them were 2D, not 3D. Uh, but uh, even those couldn't really catch errors that we would catch sometimes when we were looking at turbulent flows and then looking at uh, lift coefficients or drag coefficients and saying there's something wrong here. Um, and then you look a bit more and you discover a bug. So uh, how do you essentially choose the test with the right balance for the testing cost versus the coverage if these are um, top-down tests? Um, yeah, so... Uh what you mentioned was like this method of manufactured solutions, right? I mean, when you plug in something into the PDF. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not what, what I meant. So uh, what we are actually doing, um, uh, we have um, results from the literature uh, that involve physics, uh, where we have some rising bubbles or dam break or Rayleigh Taylor instability or some other physical process for two-phase flows. And uh, those tests that are quantifiable, where we don't just like compare pictures to each other, uh, where we have some kind of like a global parameter that's measured like a rising rising bubble velocity or something like this, um, uh, we compare to those. So we have uh, a course uh, simulation uh, test case uh, running, or let's say relatively close course, uh, and the solution should be on the diagram, so to say. So this touches the question, um, how to know uh, if something um, uh, is a bug uh, or not. And uh, for those kinds of ca cases that you mentioned also turbulence and things like this, we don't, I don't know the answer to that. So uh, I don't know how to quantify, uh, so to say, for a rising bubble on different types of unstructured meshes, maybe with adapted meshes, load balancing, how to say um, if something is better or not without uh, five of us meeting and looking at the actual diagrams and results. So we are actually like running this test case and then we get an notebook, we click on it, and then we have to compare to our previous results. And we are also comparing to the same data scanned from other uh, publications, from papers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is a bit different in the sense that uh, to, to at least the type of top-down testing that I was doing back when I was uh, a young one. And... Uh, uh, we were doing point-wise um, comparisons as well because there was this cooked-up solution. Uh, but uh, we were also doing a bit of what you're suggesting, where you're essentially looking at what are usually uh, 
2D plots that you would find in the literature of certain functions, certain variables of interest, um, and, and trying to see how close you can get to those. So that touches on the second one of my questions, which is, again, if you're comparing against a known solution, uh, whether it's from literature or uh, a previous blessed version of the software, like a released version of the software that you feel was actually bug-free, um, how do you judge uh, beyond an eyeball norm, especially within a continuous um, integration infrastructure framework where you don't just look at, okay, did I fail to build, but you also look at, did I fail to pass the test? Uh, in an automated way, how do you judge that? Do you basically try to get as close as possible to binary reproducibility for at least the integrated uh, values, if not the pointwise values? Do you do any comparison in some um, error uh, norm, whether it's uh, L2 or L1, I don't know, um, of uh, actual pointwise values, um, things like that? Yeah, so, so for verification cases where you uh, know exact solutions, then it's uh, norms. So we want to we check convergence, see if the convergence uh, has an overall increase, uh, things like this. But for for physics, uh, this is really difficult. Uh, I don't know. So I mean, this is something that we are we have a problem with that because um, you know you can have going back to this rising bubble. I mean, you, you you change a mesh a bit and the rise velocity changes a bit. So, I mean, one would have to then do statistics maybe on that. So, I mean, this is a question that we haven't yet uh, answered. So when we are doing this kind of uh, like, let's say like a rising bubble simulation, then we will have a curve of a rise velocity and we uh, uh, try to figure out and define some kind of a measure where it must be. So the, 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 the diagram should be within this, or let's say the accuracy should be within some norm. That's what we try to do, but I'm not claiming that we are doing it uh, properly or uh, it's it's very hard. This is really super hard. I mean, yeah. That's that's the reason I was asking, especially because trying to automate these things is really problematic. Um, and uh, the, there is, of course, the easy explanation of saying I want binary to or at least to uh, the last uh, decimal. Like, uh, but that's extremely hard to achieve and. Uh, if you diverge from that, and especially if you are looking mainly at integrated functions, um, uh, which are easier to, to track, uh, what you discover is, is that even for time-dependent problems, uh, unless you go far out into the future, you can have an integrated quantity that tracks fairly close to your blessed solution. But if you look at a snapshot of the actual solution fields, they can look significantly different enough that you can probably guess that if you extended the simulation by three times the amount that you were testing at, you would start seeing the curves of the integrated quantities diverge as well. It's just that the fluctuations haven't reached the point of having an impact at an integrated level, but they are already in a picture norm different enough. So that's, that's the difficulty of doing there. And frankly, I don't know if there is a, uh, even a, a, a procedure that people could agree on on how to do this. I think every research group does its own thing, but uh, uh, I don't think there is a, an agreed upon, but maybe there should start to be an agreed upon process to do this. Yeah, it's, it's like a very good, good point. I mean, that's why what we are basically doing is um, checking these notebooks and downloading the data, visualizing everything, because I mean, it's a part of our workflow uh, where we publish scientific papers. So, I mean, we cannot take the researchers out of the process. I mean, we need to look at what we did uh, in a lot of detail and very carefully check everything 100 times. So uh, it's not CI. I mean, I don't think of this as like CI, um, in, uh, the way um, software uh, industry thinks of CI, where we know if I have to connect to the database for 100 times and it needs to work in a specific way, I need uh, uh, this amount of milliseconds for it to work and everything is known. So parts of this workflow are unknown and it's research. So we have to look at the data um, ourselves and we have to discuss. And for this, we take time. We take like a day to discuss these notebooks sometimes. Yeah. So, all right, for the sake of time, thank you uh, everybody for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Tomislav, again. Uh, I'll get back to you soon to, so we can see, you know, okay. the Kima day. Uh, okay, guys, hope to see you next. Um, month. I have already, I pasted here in the chat, the webinar that we're going to have on May 12th. Again, 
uh, automated Fortran C++ bindings for larger scale scientific applications. Thank you again all. Bye.